Hello and welcome to Pankine's Empowered webinar, Pancreatic Cancer Diagnosis and New and Emerging Therapies. My name is Sophia Casbolt and I'm the Program Manager at Pankind. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. So November is World Pancreatic Cancer Awareness Month. And as a proud member of the World Pancreatic Cancer Coalition, we are continuing our effort to increase awareness, support early diagnosis and improve survival for pancreatic cancer. We welcome the other coalition members who are joining us tonight, and we look forward to continuing to work with them to raise awareness of this disease. We're also really pleased to announce that in November, we'll be opening a new grant round for collaborative research. So please check that out at our website, pankind.org.au. All right, so I just have a little bit of housekeeping to go through. Um, so I need to let you know that the information presented in these webinars is of a general nature and should not be considered personal or medical advice. Always seek independent advice relevant to your specific situation. The opinions of the presenters are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of Pankind. This webinar is intended for medical professionals, so please be aware that it does contain medical language and surgical imagery. If you experience any technical difficulties during the webinar, please let us know via the chat bar on the right of your screen or email me at sophia at pankind.org.au. A recording of the webinar will be available after tonight from our website, pankind.org.au, and only those presenting on screen will be in the recording. During this webinar, attendees' mics and cameras will be off. All right, so it's my pleasure to welcome Andrew Dean tonight. Andrew is the Head of Medical Oncology at Sir John of God Hospital in Perth and a consultant for Genesis Care. Previously, he established the Palliative Care Service at Sir Charles Gardner Hospital and St John of God Hospital in Perth and was appointed Professor of Palliative Medicine at, uh, by Edith Cowan University. He flies himself to a variety of rural areas in Western Australia including Geraldton and Broome to provide outreach oncology services. He's published articles on symptom control, novel therapies for ovarian cancer, pancreatic cancer, and the molecular profiling of solid tumors. He regularly participates in international clinical trials and continues to be a major contributor of pancreatic, lung, and ovarian cancer studies. Tonight, Dr. Dean will give us an update on the signs, symptoms, and diagnosis of pancreatic cancer, as well as new and emerging therapies. After his presentation, we'll have about 10 to 15 minutes for questions. Please send through your questions at any time though via the Q&A panel on the right. And if a question comes through that you'd also like answered, you can upvote it in the chat. Questions most relevant to today's topics or more general in nature will be prioritized. If you have questions that are specific to your circumstances, these are best directed to your healthcare team. Okay, now I'd like to hand over to Dr. Dean to present. Hello and good evening and uh, thank you very much indeed for asking me to participate in this uh, webinar about a, a topic that's very dear to my heart and um, is my main sort of research focus. So um, we're going to be talking about pancreatic cancer diagnosis and emerging treatments and what I'm hoping to do is um, put a bit of an Australian flavour on it and talk to you about some of the things that we're doing here in Australia and how it's relevant to a treatment of pancreatic cancer and in many ways leading the, um, leading the world in some of the results that we're achieving. So um, the exact uh, lead table of where pancreatic cancer comes is, is debated and you, sometimes some people say it's the fifth most common cancer, some people say it's the eighth. It's probably becoming more common with time. And in Australia, there were nearly 4,000 cases diagnosed so far this year, a pretty much equal number of um, males and females. And it's uh, even though it's not one of the mo more common cancers, it's the third most common cause of cancer death uh, in Australia in 2020, which is quite, quite a sobering thought. And um, the current f figures based on 2020 suggest that we have a 11% uh, chance of surviving at least five years if you're diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, which is, a, um, although it sounds fairly dismal, it's a significant improvement from uh, 30 years ago. Uh, so when people present, uh, I'm just going to talk about what happens when you know people go to the doctor for the first time. When people present, the, the classical teaching is that uh, 
uh, which sort of people present with painless jaundice. So they've gone yellow without any obvious um, uh, reason for it. And I think this distinguishes it from biliary colic and gallstones, which can be associated with jaundice, but usually is also a rather painful thing. Um, you can present with back pain, upper abdominal pain, or unexplained weight loss. And combinations of those symptoms is something which we, uh, um, you know, which we should be should be uh, smart about thinking require investigation. Uh, jaundice in its more um, simple uh, phase can just be a bit of yellow tinge to the eyes, and this slide's just showing what happens in the early phases of jaundice where. Uh, the skin hasn't changed colour, however, the, the eyeballs start to get a yellow tinge to it. Um, and then when that becomes more full-blown and you develop full-on jaundice, um, it can become uh, a lot more florid like that. So in fact, the whole skin can become, uh, can become quite yellow. And that's an indication that the bile ducts aren't draining at all and um, will, will usually mean that people require um, a plastic tube to be put into the biliary tree uh, you know, to drain the, uh, the bilirubin. In terms of people's past history, um, you know, we always ask uh, if there's any illnesses in the past. And uh, in recent years, we've probably noted a, a bit of an increase in inflammation of the pancreas, otherwise known as pancreatitis, um, being an initial presenting feature. And that once the initial presentation with an inflamed pancreas settles down, it becomes clear that there is actually a lump sitting uh, deeper uh, in the in the in the pancreas, and so people, in my view, with who present with pancreatitis from uh, any cause, once that pancreatitis has settled, I, I really think they should be followed up with um, blood tests, looking at the tumour markers, and repeat imaging of the pancreas. Uh, if um, patients have a family history of pancreatic cancer, we know that this increases the the, the risk. Um, if, you, if it's a single relative with pancreatic cancer, either brother, sister, mother or father, means that your own particular risk is seven times greater than, than average. And if you have two relatives, um, you know, two first degree relatives with pancreatic cancer, or a grandfather and father, or, you know, grandfather and mother, um, it, it makes the risk 35 times more likely than uh, the general population. But there is also um, an association with other inherited genetic syndromes like Lynch syndrome, which uh, where people inherit defective DNA and the, and the defective DNA leads to the development of a number of different um, you know, gastrointestinal tract uh, cancers. So when somebody walks into the surgery and uh, you examine them for that first time, the, there's a few different things that we, uh, that we look for. One is, of course, jaundice. Sometimes people look a bit wasted, uh, you know, thin. Uh, sorry, there's a bit of a feedback on the microphone there. Um, people can look a bit pale and washed out. Uh, they can look like they've lost a lot of weight. And this particular slide is showing um, the presence of some enlarged lymph nodes uh, in the neck, uh, which uh, can be felt on palpation. And that's quite a common sight of seeing, um, you know, the first signs of distant spread of a pancreatic cancer or indeed, you know, in fact, any other cancers. And when you examine people's abdomen, it's rare these days that you find it light, but when you do find it as light as we do, um, you can feel a lump in the center of the tummy, or sometimes you can palpate, uh, palpate the liver. So once we see somebody and we're suspicious that they may have pancreas, we initiate a number of investigations. Um, firstly, some blood tests, looking at the blood count, obviously liver function, because we want to see what the bilirubin is and see if there's any derangement of the other, uh, of the other liver, liver enzymes. We check the, uh, for tumor markers, that's CA19.9, which is um, a protein that's found in the bloodstream that's made in very small quantities by normal cells, uh, but is made in excess quantities, uh, particularly by cancer cells. And the CA19.9 is associated um, in high levels with pancreatic cancers and um, uh, biliary tract cancers. It is a bit of a catch, however, because anything which causes inflammation in the biliary tree, um, or in fact, even in the lungs or the esophagus and stomach can actually cause modest elevations of uh, CA19.9 or, 
although we quote that the normal reading is 37 or less, um, it's, it's fairly common that you see readings of 300, 400, 500 um, it, uh, being caused by things like gallstones. So um, if in doubt, we always sort of repeat the reading after a couple of weeks. Uh, we also check for other tumour markers like the CEA or carcinoembryonic antigen. And this is um, not specific to pancreatic tumours, but is a general gastrointestinal tract marker which uh, can be elevated in a number of different uh, gastrointestinal uh, tract uh, conditions. Um, and then CA125 is more commonly known as the ovary cancer marker, but again, uh, none of these cancer markers are specific. And there was some interesting data presented at a, um, a Asia-Pacific summit that we went to a few years ago uh, from um, a surgical colleague in Beijing, and um, they found some interesting work um, saying that the presence of a raised CA125 uh, actually was quite indicative of prognosis in pancreatic cancer. So, but that's not something that we've that we've necessarily seen replicated in our in our own data or that of data within Australia. So, once we've done our blood tests, obviously the next thing is uh, take some pictures and ha how are we going to image um, the the abdomen or you know to look for the presence of tumour. And in simple fa simple phases, often uh, ultrasound is um, is one one mechanism of doing this. Uh, sometimes patients have a ultrasound looking for a presence of gallstones, and that it turns up an abnormal mass in the pancreas. The the gold standard investigation is really a three phase CT scan. So, if we are seeing somebody for the first time and we suspect that pancreatic cancer could could be on our differential diagnosis then we would request a three-phase CT scan, where the CT scan um, is really, you get three scans in one. The first scan scans the body sort of top to toe uh, during while the contrast is flowing through the artery. Uh, the second uh, CT scan is acquired as the contrast passes through the arteries uh, and then through the capillaries into something called the portal vein, uh, which shows up the veins between the gut and the liver. Uh, and including the, the venous flow through the pancreatic area. And finally, there is a, a venous phase where the contrast is then passed through um, the liver into the rest of the body. And that is always the most accurate way of, of uh, seeing if there is a tumour in the pancreas and whether there is any involvement of the, of the blood vessels. Um, and then finally, if we're still having difficulty demonstrating reasons for symptoms or reasons for obstructive jaundice, an MRI scan or magnetic resonance scan of the pancreas, um, otherwise uh, we requested as something called an MRCP, which is uh, magnetic resonance cholangiopancreatography. Uh, so try saying that after uh, three gin and tonics. And the um, uh, the MRI scan clearly shows that the biliary tree in the pancreas in a different way to the CT, but. Um, it should never be considered as being better than a CT or a replacement for CT because the CT scan is what gives us the most consistent, reliable uh, and reproducible me uh, method of imaging the, um, you know, the pancreas, the liver and the um, biliary tree. So if we see an abnormality present, then uh, obviously we want the sample to, to see what it can be because there are you know, lots of different tumours that can be in uh, the pancreas, and for instance, obviously pancreatic cancer, pancreatic adenocarcinoma, which is what we're talking about tonight. Um, neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas, which are quite different and have completely different treatment, different prognosis. And we've even seen things like lymphomas of the pancreas. Or um, uh, in two or three weeks ago, um, I actually saw somebody who, th who was sent to me because they, th they were um, diagnosed with what they thought was pancreatic cancer. But when we... Um, investigated further, it turned out to be a lung tumour, a lung cancer that actually spread to the pancreas. So getting a tissue sample is always uh, vital uh, because that really uh, hinges, that's what, that's what makes our entire treatment decision in terms of what treatment we're going to use to, uh, you know, to, uh, to treat the cancer with. So in the slide that I showed you earlier of the lymph node, uh, the lymph node in the neck, uh, that's a very easy place to get a, um, a fine needle core uh, biopsy from. 
uh, or alternatively, you know, in people who have enlarged livers, um, you know, liver liver sample is, is good. And I just make a point that when, um, so if you're a, a GP or another specialist and you're requesting a biopsy, um, please request a core biopsy rather than a fine needle aspiration or otherwise known as FNA. And the reason for that is uh, we're doing an increasing number of molecular tests on uh, pancreatic tumours and uh, some of these tests are uh, for potentially uh, new biological treatments like PARP inhibitors if people have inherited certain gene abnormalities and if the if the biopsy is done with a fine needle we literally don't obtain enough tissue to be able to um, test it for all the molecular tests that we need to do. So we always say, look, please can we get a core biopsy rather than FNA because it gives us more tissue to test. And obviously the more tissue we have to test, the more likely we are to be able to find something that may offer some um, you know, emerging and evolving treatments. And also, um, again, being practical, many of the new trials um, of new drugs, and particularly things like immune therapies and biological agents, uh, they require a core biopsy rather than FNA because they need the extra tissue to, to try and match uh, tumour type, you know, the, the genes present in tumours uh, with the newer treatments that are being, that are being trialled. So if, um, no, if, if none of these uh, biopsy modalities are an option, then uh, we go to what we sometimes regard as the gold standard uh, which is an endoscopic ultrasound. And what this slide is showing is essentially a bit like having an endoscopy. So that anyone who's had a, a gastric ulcer or um, indigestion in the past, um, uh, who may have had an endoscopy, an endoscopic ultrasound is essentially a, an endoscope, which has got an ultrasound in the, uh, in the tip of the scope. So those of you who can see the pointer on the screen, uh, this is the endoscope coming down through the stomach. And uh, Sophia, is my pointer showing on the screen? Hopefully you can see the pointer there. So the endoscope goes down through the stomach into the duodenum. And using the ultrasound probe, they can see the area that they want to biopsy, which is under, uh, hidden behind the duodenum in the pancreas. And... Uh, the biopsy needle comes down through the endoscope and is localized by this ultrasound probe so they know exactly where to stab the needle through the wall of the duodenum. Because obviously if you look down in that with a normal endoscope, um, the, it, it, it may all look completely normal. And so it's very hard to then try and biopsy at random through the wall of the duodenum. As if you biopsy down here, you may well just get normal uh, normal pancreas and miss the uh, you know miss the diagnosis completely. So what the operator of the endoscope sees is a picture a bit like this. And on the left hand side here, we've got the um, the ultrasound scan, which always looks like uh, looking for a snowman uh, in a in a snowstorm. But essentially, what you're looking for is a disruption in the pattern. So you may see these um, these black shadows. Uh, uh, within a um, sort of the white snowstorm and these these shadows are what you're essentially aiming at so you'll see here at the top of the screen that the needle has been passed uh, through uh, the wall of the bowel and is just sampling the top of this mass which has been seen here in the pancreas and at the top this little circle is actually the ultrasound probe so the ultrasound probe is firing sound waves and the sound waves are reflecting off the tissue and hence you see a very straight line, uh, which is highly reflective, which is the needle. But underneath the, um, the is, a, is a mass which has disrupted the tissue planes and is absorbing a lot of the ultrasound waves. And hence it looks like, um, like a sort of a, a black shadow in the middle of the, of the uh, snowstorm. And what you see um, on CT um, is, uh, is a cross-sectional CT where this is the the left kidney, the right kidney, that's the liver. And then uh, there's a number of blood vessels uh, around the pancreas. And then you can see there's a tumor sat there within the pancreas. Now, if we were trying to biopsy that through the abdominal wall, uh, obviously it's a long way in and we, we've got uh, duodenum 
uh, you know, we've got, we've got small bowel stuff in between that, we've got blood vessels in the way. Um, it's not exactly um, a risk-less procedure to try and biopsy a tumour lump like that. So if you can imagine that you've passed an endoscope down through the duodenum here, the duod um, you can select the point at which you can biopsy the tumour without passing through the blood vessels that are, that are in the way. So endoscopic as ultrasound is, is really now one of the most important investigations that we use for pancreatic cancer, not just for obtaining the biopsy, but also because it provides a very, very clear picture of whether the tumour is um, attached to the wall of the blood vessels. And that's a, an important thing to determine surgical uh, approaches to the pancreas. And what we'll do is we're, we're going to take a closer look at that uh, as we uh, proceed with our discussion. Um, now, there, there is, it is quite a reasonable... Um, time actually. I'm just going to take the first uh, question from uh, Andrew. And uh, Andrew, your question, which I'm just going to read out to the audience is um, that I have had two family members diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Should I have annual tests for tumour markers? Now, that's um, a very good question. The simple answer is yes, you should go, go for screening, but tumour markers themselves are not necessarily reliable as a number of pancreatic tumours don't make um, tumour markers, so probably 20% of people with, with you know, quite significant uh, size tumours have normal pancreatic markers. Uh, so there's been increasing um, interest in using this endoscopic ultrasound technique to, um, to assess the pancreas. And so uh, here in Perth, um, my colleagues who do the endoscopic ultrasound actually offer a screening service for anyone who's had two family members with pancreatic cancer. Uh, we strongly recommend a genetics referral so that you can speak to the genetics counsellors. You can actually have gene tests carried out to look for genetic abnormalities including BRCA1, BRCA2, um, ATM mutations uh, and a thing called CDN2, CDKN2A mutations. Uh, to name a few, um, and these can be these are inherited gene faults. And if you have an inherited gene fault, then you know that you're in particular need of regular screening. So, um, if you are, if you came to see me for an opinion, ask my question on that. Uh, my my opinion, I would say to you, um, uh, yes, you should see genetics, and um, don't rely on tumour markers alone. Uh, I would suggest that you see a gastroenterologist with a specific interest in endoscopic ultrasound uh, because they will almost certainly offer you uh, a yearly um, ultrasound test on of the pancreas which will be done under, under anaesthetic and um, that's one of the more reliable ways of picking up early tumours. So um, back to the topic. So um, what happens when we you know when we when we found the tumour well we now do something called um, staging and um, People often talk about staging and get, get uh, misconceptions. And what's important about this is, um, you know, stage one, stage two, stage three, and stage four, they're really just um, methods of communicating a treatment approach uh, to do the different stages of cancer. And for instance, stage one is generally treated with surgery, usually now followed by chemotherapy. Stage two is surgery followed by uh, chemotherapy occasionally with radiotherapy and we'll talk about the differences in staging in a sec and stage three is not um, what we call locally advanced tumors uh, they're not routine don't operate on those because by the fact that they're stage three you know that they're inoperable however there's a, a, a lot of data accumulating now on how we can uh, downstage people from stage three to stage two through the use of chemotherapy and radiotherapy. I'm going to show you some of our own Australian data on that fairly shortly. And stage four tumours really will pretty much never, I say pretty much never, um, be resected um, and that you primarily, primarily rely upon the role of chemotherapy and occasionally integration of certain forms of radiotherapy in order to, uh, to treat these. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about uh, about the um, the staging. 
So stage one and stage two tumours uh, nowadays when they're removed with either a Whipple's operation or a distal pancreatectomy, um, there are two forms of chemotherapy which have been shown to improve the survival and that is uh, chemotherapy with a, a recipe called modified fulfurinox. Um, and that's a, although that's got a reputation as being a fairly uh, difficult um, recipe to get through, I think as we've gained more and more experience with this chemotherapy recipe, we are um, much more confident that people can get through treatment with this recipe uh, and still, you know, still have a reasonable quality of life. And the the uh, the recipe for Firinox has been associated with the best improvement in survival for pancreatic cancer that we've seen so far. Um, whereas there is a more gentle recipe for people who perhaps where Firinox is thought to be uh, uh, too uh, too strong or too harsh. And if people are a fairly frail uh, or if people don't tolerate Firinox, there is another recipe called uh, Gemcitabine with capecitabine, which has been shown to improve the cure rate, not as, not as much as fulfirinox, but nonetheless uh, it is actually a sufficient um, improvement compared to, um, compared to no treatment. Um, with stage 3 and 4 tumours, it's a different approach, and um, there's a lot of discussion about what we use first line and second line, and what this slide is showing is, um, you know, if you're diagnosed with a stage three or stage four pancreatic tumor, the prime the prime therapy is fulfurinox or gemcitabine plus nabapaclitaxel. And there's reasons uh, why we some centers prefer one, some centers prefer the other. And we developed a lot of experience with gemcitabine and nabapaclitaxel, uh, otherwise known as abraxane. Uh, we gained a huge amount of experience with that early on, thanks to the uh, generosity of the um, pharmace pharmaceutical company that make a Braxane or, or bring it into Australia and they gave us an enorm enormous amount of free drug actually to treat people uh, before it had been approved by the uh, PBS and so um, you know we developed we a lot of experience using this this particular recipe up front in people with stage 3 pancreatic cancers who had uh, very very good responses and we'll show you some of those uh, shortly um, whereas, in the, certainly in the public system, uh, the government um, currently reimburses Fulfurinox, so that is usually the, the gold standard for uh, treatment uh, of stage 3 cancers up front uh, in an effort to try and shrink the tumour down to, to operate on. Now, if you look at the literature, there's probably an equal amount of publications at, and presentations at all the, the big international meetings. Um, were all extolling the, you know, the, the success rates they've had with using Fulfurinox up front, other centres using the Gemcitabine and Nabapaclitaxel up front. And really there's probably not a lot to choose between them. They both seem to be effective, just that we, we, we personally have had a lot more success with the Gemcitabine and Nabapaclitaxel than has been seen in, the same, in our same service with Fulfurinox. Uh, we also have uh, second line chemotherapies and um, so that's for people who don't respond well to the first line um, and in particular if we talk about stage four um, or we're otherwise known as metastatic um, pancreatic cancer um, the the general consensus now is to lead with gemcitabine plus nabapaclitaxel uh, because this drug uh, nabapaclitaxel is only approved in Australia for pancreatic cancer if it's used in the first line metastatic setting. So in other words, if you uh, were offered chemotherapy for a stage four pancreatic cancer and you chose fulfurinox up front, then the government will not reimburse gemcitabine plus nabapaclitaxel as a second line therapy. Whereas if you treat people the other way, if you have gemcitabine and nabapaclitaxel up front, uh, the fulfurinox drugs are all completely covered for whatever stage you want um, in the treatment line. So for stage 4 cancers, pretty much everywhere now should be using gemcitabine and nabapaclitaxel up front. And then we've got the option of other chemotherapy recipes that are shown below uh, for second and third line therapy. And again, um, that in itself, what I, what I just said, is a, is a, is a somewhat uh, uh, controversial um, statement because um, 
you know, it wasn't, it wasn't, it was not many years ago that we had a um, a, a powwow, a get together of everybody who was treating pancreatic cancer around Australia. And um, when they said, "Oh, what do you use? Um, you know, what do you use third line?" There were blank stares, and people said, "There is no third line treatment for pancreatic cancer." And um, what I'm hoping to do is to show you our data that we've gathered on third line treatment. So in other words, you know, first line treatment is the first recipe, second line treatment is the second, and then now is what we're doing, third line. And uh, I want to show you just some of the results that we've, that we've had with that, which we actually hope are uh, changing the, uh, the landscape internationally. So some of our um, second and third line um, uh, research has now been taken on as um, kind of recommended gold standard therapy on the international scene, so I'm, I'm, I'll show you some more of that shortly. So before we get a bit more onto some more detailed uh, information on the staging and the treatments, um, one of the commonest questions that I get asked is, why can't you chop it out? And um, I guess what, what, I, what I want to show you, so if you're not, if you don't, if you're not keen on um, um, seeing any medical pictures you might now's a good time to make a cup of tea uh, but this is um, the um, this is the anatomy in the area so what I'm showing you here is the is the pancreas which sat behind the duodenum so on the previous uh, endoscopic ultrasound picture you'd, you'd imagine that the endoscope would come down the esophagus here into the stomach um, in this case they've shown a, a, a tumor in the tail of the pancreas and that would be You'd be able to ultrasonically biopsy that through the wall of the stomach. But if you want to interrogate the head of the pancreas, obviously the endoscope has to come all the way down here and um, biopsy through the wall of the duodenum. You have um, gallbladder and biliary ducts. You have the pancreatic duct. And this is the problem, is all of these vessels, all of these blood vessels, which are so... Um, kind of surround the pancreas and so intimately involved with the pancreas that um, when you go to do uh, surgery um, you see literally that the, this is an area that, where this is a, a piece of pancreas here labeled as pancreas the tumor that's just been removed has sat right in this spot here and depending on the position of the tumor if the tumor is pushing in one way it can bind to this artery here called the celiac axis or celiac artery it can involve the artery to the liver, the spleen, the artery that supplies the, um, the gut, called the superior mesenteric artery, uh, or the vein that drains uh, from the um, drains the uh, blood flow from the bowel back into the inferior vena cava here. And th these are all highly uh, important vascular structures which uh, you can't really chop out and remove. And hence, you know, if you imagine that there's a tumour sat in the middle of all those blood vessels, um, you know, they, all it needs to do is to fix to one of them, and you can go through a six or seven hour operation and be completely unable to actually get the uh, to get that tumour out. Um, and this is what this is what it looks like after a dissection, where you have the the main vein that drains the body called the inferior vena cava. Uh, we've got the um, the uh, superior mesenteric vein. And the, and the vein that comes in from the spleen, the splenic vein, and they join together. This is sometimes called the confluence, uh, which then um, the confluence of the splenic vein and the supermesenteric, and that forms something called the portal vein, which then flows off to go down to the liver. And again, this is, this is the area where the tumour can sit and involve any one of those vessels. And really that's just um, showing you the, arterial, the arteries that are present in the same space. So all of these veins and arteries are really all kind of uh, all interrelated and the pancreas sits slap bang in the middle of those and that's why uh, surgery to try and remove that is, is notoriously uh, uh, hard work. So what I'd, what I'd like to do is, is now sort of really we're talking about you know what, what about outcome from pancreatic cancer and this is just um, a schema that I, I put up looking at uh, global figures and our own figures uh, associated with uh, how it used to be with uh, with pancreatic cancer and for every 100 people who walk through the door uh, when you do the scans it seems that uh, 
about a quarter of those are, are have a removable tumour, the tumour that appears operable. And so out of these 25 people who go to the operating theatre, uh, once they get into the, um, the abdomen, again, it can take sometimes six or seven hours of operating. Um, sometimes it's found that the pancreatic tumour involves the blood vessels, um, despite uh, the best imaging that we have saying that they were clear. So again, one in distress that there is no such thing as an absolute guarantee with any of the tests that we do to determine whether 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 uh, tumours are definitely operable or not. And I think most of the time our, our surgeons tell tell patients going for surgery that we believe that the tumour is removable, but there's always a risk that once we get in, you know, we may find something that, that means we can't chop it out. But the sobering thought is for those people who do actually have surgery, um, so and the 20 people who do have surgery, and there are generally only four people are still alive at five years, which means the 16 people who have had surgery to remove what appears to be a curable tumour, um, you know, have actually died from this disease. Now, this figure is changing, and that's what I'm, that's what the next uh, series of slides is going to be about. But it makes the point that um, that, that uh, three quarters of the people we see with pancreatic cancer have inoperable disease at diagnosis. Um, most having um, what we call locally advanced, but unfortunately a, a significant group having tumour that's already spread, usually to the usually to the liver. And the five-year survival figures um, for these numbers are actually really poor. It's very rare that somebody with metastatic, you know, stage four pancreatic cancer is actually alive at five years. Um, and whereas there's a few uh, with locally advanced disease who, who actually do make it. And that really leads on to the prognosis. And so when you talk about prognosis and so well, what's, you know, what is the prognosis? And then we talk about, well, okay, it really depends upon the staging. And it, as it's the staging that determines the treatment, uh, you know, the, the, the treatment, the, uh, well, the prognosis and the staging are all sort of intimately related. So stage one pancreatic cancers, which have the best results, have a tumour that's present within the pancreas. Um, and that the tumour is smaller than two centimetres. And it's, it's rare that you find a tumour in the pancreas that small. Um, usually it's a tumour that's found by accident because somebody has a, um, a scan carried out for another reason, such as a, a back pain problem or um, a gallbladder issue. And, and literally, you know, the tumour's found uh, early. It's uh, less than 20 millimetres. And we regard that as a very... Um, uh, the earliest possible stage of tumour. If it's between 20 millimetres and 40 millimetres, uh, then it's, it's, and it's not spread anywhere else, it's a, it's a stage 1B. Um, if the cancer's uh, larger than 4 centimetres, it's a stage 2A. And then if it starts to spread to the local, we call local or local regional lymph nodes, uh, then it becomes a stage 2B. And so the staging is really just kind of trying to trying to tell us where the tumour is, which then helps us to try and plan the treatment approach for that. Um, but obviously, as the stage goes up, it means that the tumour is more advanced and that the risk of there being uh, metastatic spots that have already spread, so in other words, tumour cells that have spread and floated off in the bloodstream, that risk is clearly getting bigger as uh, the, the stage goes up, which means that there is, in fact, a later, a later tumour. And then stage three, which is what we might call locally advanced, um, you know, it's, it's to do with whether the tumour is, is attached to any one of those blood vessels that we saw before. And you'll see in this diagram, the, um, you know, the tumour is attached up here to the celiac um, artery. And down here, it may be involving one of the superior mesenteric either arteries or veins. And, and that's whether whether it is or isn't in the nodes. Yeah, the fact is the tumour is attached to the blood vessels, and that means that it's not immediately operatable on. And uh, again, that just shows this is where the tumour sits, and uh, you know whether whether blood vessels are there to get involved. And these CT scans are really showing uh, the same same picture. And um, this the bottom. Uh, bottom quarter of the slide here is showing the relationship between the pancreas and the, the blood vessels that we've just been looking at the pictures of. 
And if we cross to the right, you'll see that the, the head of the pancreas, which, uh, which sits in front of the inferior vena cava, uh, which is shown, shown um, sorry, here, here, sorry. And um, you'll see that the head of the pancreas is right against the blood vessels called the superior mesenteric vein. And if we look on this schema here, you'll see that um, here's the tumor. You can see it's wrapped around the superior mesenteric uh, vein. It appears to uh, uh, probably be free of the superior mesenteric artery. And there's the, there's the uh, aorta there and the inferior vena cava here. So that tumor would be considered inoperable by virtue of the attachment to the superior mesenteric vein. And then finally, of course, um, when we talk about staging, stage four pancreatic cancer means the tumor has spread to other parts of the body and most commonly that's the liver um, cells can fall off the pancreas itself into the abdomen to the, into the peritoneal cavity and obviously can spread through the bloodstream to, to, to end up in the, in the lungs as well um, and uh, this is what this is what liver metastases look like um, when tumor has spread via the portal vein into the liver and all of these, uh, the white things, all represent tumor, tumors that are burrowed into the liver. And you can see that there's no, no surgery could ever remove uh, all of those individual spots. Uh, you know, they're, they're always widespread. And preceding this, before you could see all this um, scattered uh, tissue, there would be a multitude of tiny spots that really, little things like this that you're not going to be able to see, and little things like this that you're not going to be able to see on CT scans or ultrasounds, and that's the, the, that's the risk with pancreatic cancer, is that it spreads so, so quickly. So when we look at life expectancy by stage, you'll see that if people have what they think is an early cancer, so stage one or stage two, and you have surgery only, uh, the, the, uh, the cure rate is only about 10%, uh, whereas using simple chemotherapy like gemcitabine does produce some improvement in that. And then we spoke earlier about gemcitabine and capecitabine, which it produces significant improvement over the, uh, the original treatment of single agent gemcitabine, which came out in the 90s. And of course, nowadays we have um, uh, the, you know, the, the latest recipe, which has been so successful in the, in the Prodigy study, um, which has um, shown a, a marked improvement in what we call progression-free survival and overall survival. And uh, when that data matures, um, we're projecting at the moment that this will probably be approximately 45% of people who've received surgery, followed by uh, the Fulpirinox recipe, uh, we're expecting about a 45% cure rate. Um, in terms of, I think we, we touched upon this before, and really this is going to a little, just a little bit more detail, um, and it's just that the Fulpirinox is the gold standard, and um, if we compare it to gemcitabine on its own, uh, the, um, you know, the average time for relapse of people that get gemcitabine is about 12 months. You know, it's 22 months with the fulfurinox. And um, you know, the, what we call median overall survival, which is the, uh, you know, the average survival time after this treatment is, is past the four year mark. And obviously when we talk about median survivals and average survivals, <clears throat> uh, this, is, um, you know, this means that 50% of people do better than that. And, and it's the 50% of people who do better that, that are uh, the ones who are you know, more likely to be cured. Because uh, if, you, you know, if, you, if you don't have relapse, if you're disease-free by five years, generally it's extremely unlikely that you would, would, uh, would relapse subsequently. Um, one of the big debates, and it's something which we were supposed to be hosting a, a, our national medical meeting medical oncology meeting this year here in Perth, but due to apparently there's a, a virus doing the rounds that has uh, somehow interfered with those plans. So our meeting in fact didn't go ahead. So I'm rather hoping that next year we'll be able to have the same meeting, the same discussion. And one of the big discussion points is if you find an early tumor, um, perhaps you know it's, it might be not quite touching the blood vessels, there might be some, a few lymph nodes involved. You know, should people go straight to surgery and obviously there's a, a strong yes that says, well, you should because you can resect it while you can. And if you can chop it out now, then potentially you've got better local control. Um, but there's also a, a counter argument to that, which, uh, which, which says that the, um, 
Um, when you find the tumor, there's significant risk that there are already seeds that have spread to the liver. So if you have surgery and, the and you have an uncomplicated recovery and start your chemotherapy quickly, hopefully you kill those seeds in the liver before they take root. But if you have a, a long recovery time or a complicated recovery time, then by the time you get to start on what's supposed to be your uh, adjuvant chemotherapy to increase the chance of being cured, um, the tumours may well have um, already taken root and um, you know, uh, consequently the results are much worse. And there's a lot, a lot of debate about this topic at the moment, but um, we probably, um, in a nutshell, really say that uh, people with early tumours where you can resect them, if you can resect them with confidence, you should probably get on and do it quickly. Um, but there are also studies that are ongoing looking at treating people with chemo first because the uh, people who progress rapidly following surgery are probably the people who would have best benefited by having chemo up front. So, um, you know, that's that's another whole debate which we may get onto in, um, we might be able to get onto that one in, um, in some of the discussion. Um, and there's a, a sort of an in-between phase where you might say it sits somewhere between stage two and stage three and um, it's pr approximately a third of people who walk through the door have a tumour that compromises partially uh, at least one blood vessel and um, literally you only need a little bit of shrinkage to make it operable and so uh, the vast majority of people with so-called borderline resectable tumours will now be offered chemotherapy and um, you know generally probably I would say at least half of these ultimately go on to be resected, but um, you know, there's always um, a risk that if you operate, you go through a six-hour operation and can't remove it, and if you don't operate, that the tumour could potentially grow and involve the blood vessel more by the time the you know, decision is made to, to try and proceed for surgery. So there are multiple arguments, and there isn't necessarily a right one, um, other than saying that the risk of you operating on borderline and finding it's worse than what you think is probably uh, significantly higher uh, than any chance that it will be better than better than what the imaging shows. And this is just a, a typical example of, of the modern era of chemo. And this this was um, uh, a patient of mine in 2009 who, this is um, uh, the CT scan which is showing a view straight up and down. So the head's at the top of the screen, here's the heart and here's the liver. There's the stomach and there's a huge tumour of the pancreas that was wrapped around all of the blood vessels, was completely inoperable. And um, this lady was well, the first lady outside America to receive nabpaclitaxel um, for her pancreatic cancer. And this was the same thing six weeks later with a massive reduction in the size of the tumour. That lady is very much alive and well today. Um, she's now 11 years since she had an inoperable pancreatic tumour. And it makes the point that just because uh, things are inoperable doesn't always mean that ultimately you can't get good long-term disease control. And we've really touched on that for the interest of time. I just wanted to show this other case. This was a lady who had surgery um, to attempt to resect this big pancreatic tumour, uh, which um, is interesting because the tumours are completely encircling at least two blood vessels. If you look at this, all of this is tumour, and if you look on, on this, you can see that this tumour here is literally surrounding all these different blood vessels. And so not surprisingly, the surgery was unsuccessful. However, after uh, having six months of chemotherapy with the gemcitabine and abraxane, uh, she was successfully operated on, and uh, all of the tumour had actually died off to, to give something that we call a complete pathological response, uh, which obviously resulted in a very good outcome. And, we ended up actually publishing our, our data, a group of us got together back in 2012 and presented our um, data to the ASCO annual meeting, which I think was the first time that uh, this, this topic had, had been uh, presented and it was uh, treatment which was really pioneered here in Australia um, of treating people with this combination of drugs and, being, and reporting successful resection of completely inoperable uh, patients. Um, Probably just worth mentioning that there is a, 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 a lot of discussion about the role of radiotherapy for pancreatic cancer in the curative setting. And we know that um, if you give people um, old-fashioned radiation, 
uh, that it's, it doesn't really work very well and can be fairly harmful. However, the newer studies with all the fancy new radiation machines are showing uh, clear benefits in terms of reduction of local recurrence of pancreatic tumours. So uh, we, we, we definitely um, encourage people to seek a radiation oncology opinion from a radiation oncologist who's experienced in, in pancreatic work. Now this, uh, this slide here um, just shows uh, when we integrate radiotherapy and chemotherapy preoperatively. So if we have somebody with inoperable tumours who um, uh, receive six months of chemo up front followed by radiation and then go on to surgery, uh, that the overall survival for this is 51 months, which is actually a really, really um, impressive uh, figure. And um, this is showing that of 68 people that we uh, found who were un um, with unresectable pancreatic cancer, so stage three tumors, who had six months of chemotherapy, then radiation, were then, um, of these 68, 20 people were actually able to have their successful pancreatic resection. And um, at least 50% of them were still alive at beyond four years. And a number of these people have actually uh, never ever uh, relapsed, um, which is obviously fantastic news to to um, to then be cured from what we call lo locally advanced uh, disease. Uh, I'm just going to finish off by saying um, I'm just going to talk about new new disease uh, new things and metastatic pancreatic cancer. This is shown here with their lesions uh, centered within the liver. Um, globally, the survival that's quoted is between three and six months without treatment nine to 12 months with treatment. Uh, our Australian data is way better than that uh, for a number of different reasons. And I'm gonna go straight to that actually, which is um, which talks about how is Australia doing. And in Lancet Oncology last year, um, there was a publication in September, 18th of September, that showed that Western Australia has the best survival in the world for cancer of the pancreas, stomach, ovary, and colon. And that, um, the, uh, so this study looked at Australia, looked at Victoria, New South Wales, and WA, Canada, Denmark, Ireland, New Zealand, Norway, UK, etc., and looked at cancer outcomes. And in fact, Western Australia had a five year survival of 15.2%, closely followed by New South Wales and Victoria. And this uh, gave Australia as a whole a 14.6% five year survival compared to the global 11%. And, you know, people, Ask well, why, why do we do so well? And I think firstly, um, believe it or not, the government actually funds drugs for us really quickly and really sensibly. So it makes good drugs available to us very quickly. But also uh, Australia has been very active in terms of research and looking at what drugs uh, we give and when. And uh, this shows our Western Australian survival of um, uh, pancreatic uh, cancer that is advanced stage three and four. And our data is that people with the locally advanced tumours have an average survival of 34 months compared to the global 12 to 18 and 19 months for metastatic disease. That's obviously you know, average survival compared to uh, 9 to 12 months. And there's a couple of different reasons as to why that is. And um, one of which is that we, we actually reported, uh, we were the first people globally to report the use of the recipe Fulfirinox as a second line therapy. So this was after people had failed gemcitabine and the Braxane. And we initially made our first case reports of this in at the World GI meeting in 2014. And we recently updated our survival to show that people, our survival figures, uh, to show that um, of the 85 people in our study group, um, including 64% who had stage four cancer at diagnosis, for those who were well enough to receive second line chemotherapy with Fulfirinox, um, the average survival was 46 months, uh, and of that, that was, um, you know, that was actually um, uh, 68 months for locally advanced tumours, which is over five years, and uh, 23 months for metastatic uh, disease. And again, that um, when I talked about third-line chemotherapy before, um, we've now gone to using gemcitabine plus nabpaclitaxel not just as our first line therapy, but if people go on to second line therapy with Fulfirinox and fail, we then go on to third line therapy and, and retreat people with the first recipe. And again, um, people who are well enough to, to go on to third line therapy 
um, uh, you know, it had, had extremely uh, good prolonged survivals relating to, um, you know, to, to sort of... Uh, so I just want to finish off now with one, one, one very interesting new drug which we've just completed a uh, trial with. And this is just showing one of the issues we have with pancreatic cancer is that the, the fluorescent green is actually um, chemotherapy drugs that are trying to penetrate the tumor. And you can see the tumor's all dark because one of the issues we have is that the drugs don't penetrate the tumor very well. So th this is a, a test done um, using um, what we call a fluorescent etching agent. And essentially, you have a mouse that you give therapy to. Sorry about the feedback. And, and if you then use a special computer technique to remove the fluorescence from the circulating chemotherapy, you see that literally all of the drug in this particular mouse, um, with a, there's the mouse's pancreas shown here, and um, all of the drug is, is removed by the etching technique. If you use um, SEND, uh, which is a drug which hijacks a feeding protein in the wall of the cancer cell, um, it actually enables a, uh, the, the drugs to penetrate the tumor and penetrate them well. And uh, you'll see here that when you give SEND plus the same chemotherapy, and then you use the etching agent, you can see that the drug has been deposited in the pancreatic tumor, uh, showing that the SEND is really enabling um, the drug to penetrate deeply. And again, this is this is just a schema where the, the fluoro green is showing the, the fluorescent chemo, and this is without send on the left, with send on the right, and similar thing with a with a colorectal tumor on the bottom. And so we we reported this at the recent uh, ESMO European Society of Medical Oncology meeting. And uh, the thing that we really want to show you is this thing called a waterfall plot, where this uh, middle line here is what we call the baseline. So this is the size of the tumor when it was diagnosed. And this is showing either the growth of the tumor, which goes up. Each of these individual bars represent one person. And of course, if it goes up, it means the tumor grows. And if it goes down, it means that the tumor is shrinking. And when you see a waterfall plot like that, where all of our three patients have had reduction in size of the tumor, a lot of them very, very significant reductions. Uh, that's something that's very, uh, very impressive. And the Australian GI Cancer Institute, uh, we're working with the Australian GI Cancer Institute now to, um, to progress this trial into what's called a phase two trial, uh, where we're hoping to, uh, to build on this results. And um, hopefully we'll see this as an exciting new treatment that's gonna change the prognosis long term. So I'm sorry if I've droned on a little bit longer than what I expected to, and I hope that you have uh, enjoyed the uh, enjoyed the topic or found it uh, interesting, and I look forward to handing over any questions. So thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you. That was so great. So we do have a few questions. So um, somebody asked, who conducts tests for tumor markers? Um, saying that GPs aren't necessarily always educated about this. So how do you go about getting a tumor marker test? Um, well, one is, is to simply just say to your family doctor, um, you know, um, either I'm in follow-up for a tumor or, um, you know, I've had 15 family members with certain tumors and, you know, is it, could I have my tumor markers checked? Now, um, you know, that it's, it's not, it's not. It should never be regarded as a good one-off test because, um, you know, a tumor marker by itself is is so completely irrelevant. For instance, a appendicitis can give you um, a significantly raised CA125. It can be as high as certain ovarian cancers can 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 give. So, you, you always want to put the uh, the tumor marker in the context of the clinical situation. And that's something that hopefully that, you know, if you have a concern with that, your family doctor uh, or your treating specialist can discuss that with you as to why it's appropriate or why it's not appropriate to measure a tumor marker in your, in your particular case. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, somebody has also asked about, so previously you mentioned getting scans if you have relatives for, who have pancreatic cancer. So somebody's just asked if age is a factor in that. So if you're quite young, should you still be getting annual scans or is there an age-related factor to, to getting those scans? Um, 
Can you hear me okay? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. So, um, again, if, if you're young, um, you generally want to be avoiding what we call ionizing radiation. So you want to be avoiding, uh, you know, re- repeated CT scans when you're in your 30s and 40s, and, and even, even preferably in your 50s. Um, you know, so the scans which do not involve ionizing radiation are endoscopic ultrasound, which is quite, a, you know, it is an invasive procedure, it requires a, a light anesthetic. Um, but if you are particularly high risk, your gastroenterologist or upper GI surgeon or oncologist can actually advise you as to whether that's a good technique for you. Um, but uh, endoscopic ultrasound doesn't use any ionizing radiation at all. It's just using reflected sound waves and is perfectly safe. And in other cases where perhaps they, that may not be suitable or possible, uh, the MRI scans, so what we call the MRCP, the magnetic resonance scan, uh, that's another method of looking at the pancreas in reasonable detail, but without using ionizing radiation. Okay, thank you for that. Um, somebody asked, um, what are your thoughts on the ALAN protocol? Uh, sorry, I've no, no, I'm, you know, I have no idea what you're referring to. Okay, Susan, maybe if you can provide us a little bit more detail on that, we might be able to help answer that question. Um, somebody else has asked about uh, if there's any movement in utilising artificial intelligence for early detection of symptoms. Uh, that's interesting, and um, there has been quite a uh, collaboration with uh, IBM Watson to name uh, just one kind of artificial intelligence platform. And um, yeah, it's quite it's quite interesting because one of the big topics that we were planning to talk about at the MOGA meeting, the Medical Oncology Group of Australia, um, one of my plenary topics that I, I wanted to to have was a whole session about artificial intelligence and uh, using artificial intelligence, you know, obviously for, uh, you know, detection, screening, and as well as treatment. So uh, there's a huge interest in it. And I think there's a lot of different collaborations going on. And, and I was hoping to be able to enlighten everybody about it in, um, in August until a certain virus popped up. Mm. Well, um, hopefully we'll hear more about that soon then. Is there sort of movement in using it in patients or is it all sort of in trial at the moment or just early stage research? Um, well, I think there's, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of collaboration with anonymous data because obviously, you know, we don't, nobody want, nobody's going to share, you know, personal data, but de-identified data um, and putting it into, um, uh, you know, diagnostic sort of diagnostic pattern detection. Mm-hmm. I, think, I think it's fair to say that there are uh, studies now um, in, in multiple different cancers looking at it for detection screening and also for treatment decision making as well because you could argue that artificial intelligence may may remove personal biases from, you know, from the data but uh, there's always the problem that the artificial intelligence sometimes doesn't have that uh, gut feeling that you get with a combination of experience, uh, good results, horrific side effects, and um, you know just the 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 experience of, you know that you accumulate over years and years of treating this. Mm-hmm. So I mean I'm I, I'm actually really excited by what it may hold, but at the end of the day, you know, do you really want to walk into a um, you know, doctor's surgery and have a robot, come, you know, produce the probe and and uh, and tell you what you do and don't want, or or you know, do you do you actually want to have a uh, you know a rational discussion with um, with your doctor about why you might want to do something? Because often it's not a straight you know put in the data and you get a yes or no answer. It's it's you put the you put your data in and you discuss the you know your risks and uh, concerns. And sometimes very subtle symptoms, and the experienced medical practitioner that you see will kind of, you know, assemble from that a balance of probabilities and discuss those probabilities with you in relation to what treatments you can, you know, or, or what the options are, you know, and it might be options for screening, options for diagnosis, options for treatment. Hmm. Yeah, it would be really interesting to see what comes of that. 
Um, so we have a few more questions if, if you have time. We're running a little bit late, but um, if, you, if you have a few more minutes um, to answer a couple more questions, Andrew? Sure. Yeah, great, thank you. So um, there's been a couple of questions here. Um, are there any treatments for people who have surgical cure and have finished chemo? Um, so, in other words, is there uh, anything that you can, I guess I would read into that, is there any possibility is, of maintenance treatment? Would, is that, do you think that's a reasonable interpretation? I think that's, yeah, reasonable, yeah. Yeah, so, so I think if you, I mean, generally, you have your surgery, you have your chemotherapy, hopefully with, uh, you know, 12 cycles of polyphyrinox, and hopefully you get through, you know, relatively unscathed and still with a sense of humour. Um, if there is, uh, if there was evidence in pathology of tumour invasion into any, um, any, into any of the local nerves, or uh, if the resection margin was what we call a very close resection margin, in other words, when you've done the surgery to kind of cut around the tumour, you haven't got a, you know, a, a really clear rind of normal tissue. And um, then obviously that's that's when we start to, it's, in our practice, we, we do tend to discuss uh, the role of radiation mm -hmm. and the radiotherapy to the resection bed and the, uh, you know, the lymphatic areas. Um, you know, we, we, we believe that makes a significant contribution to reduce the risk of local recurrence. Um, and it's just that the cancer cells, if the, if the margin is very close, there's always a risk that there may be a few cells caught in scar tissue. And in particular, if the if the tumor cells grow into the nerve uh, the nerve sheaths, um, they can kind of creep up those nerve sheaths. And um, the problem is that things like chemotherapy drugs don't necessarily penetrate scar tissue and nervous tissue very well, which is why we tend to then talk about giving radiotherapy. So with people who are regarded as at risk, um, that's those are the ones who we would always then discuss potentially, you know, radiation. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, so I did get um, some clarification about that protocol that was mentioned earlier. So they were asking about um, treatment with intravenous alpha lip, uh, lipoic acid and low dose naltrexone. Right. So um, alpha lipoic acid was uh, has been around for a while as a treatment for neuropathy. Yeah. Uh, and some people feel that uh, alpha lipoic acid actually does uh, help mm -hmm. peripheral neuropathy, which can be associated with certain chemotherapy, um, you know, associated with some of the chemotherapy drugs that we use. And that's one of the, you know, the, I'm sure it's one of the banes of our lives, let alone the banes of the lives of people who are actually going through it, you know, with neuropathy. Um, but um, I'm not aware of it having any sort of anti-cancer actions. And we have our own peripheral neuropathy prevention strategies that we have with everyone that we have on chemotherapy. So, um, you know, there are, there's, there's some interesting new work in a drug called PEA, which is it's actually a, a fatty acid called palmitoyl ethanol amide. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not found in the body, um, but if you take an excess of it, uh, it appears to help repair some of the neuronal damage or at least certainly prevent, you know, worsening of the neuropathy. So we have a, a trial protocol uh, currently uh, with the uh, Australian Gastrointestinal um, Trials Group or, you know, GI Cancer Institute. We're hoping to be able to launch that trial where we can uh, prove whether or not PEA actually works to prevent neuropathy. And we're hoping to have some have that up, you know, up and running next year. That's great. Um, that's actually answered another question that we had about anything on the horizon for neuropathy as well. So that's fantastic. Um, and there's, there's, I think that that's most of the questions. I'm aware that we have, um, we are running a little bit late. So I'm really sorry if we haven't quite got to your question. Um, but perhaps uh, we should leave it there, Andrew. So I know we're gone a little bit over for tonight yeah my apologies uh, apologies for uh, perhaps banging on a little bit but it is one of my one of my favorite topics and I think it's just so important that you know pancreatic cancer is 
you know, often the poor relation of all the other cancers, and it seems to get the least attention, the least funding. And you know, I'm uh, I'm a, obviously a massive fan of you know Pankind for you know the work it does in trying to you know promote the um, you know the cause and to raise awareness that you know pancreatic cancer is a disease with a really poor cure rate, and you know we're all working as hard as we can to try and change that. But the amount of funding that pancreas cancer gets in comparison to, you know, the, you know, the, the other big cancers is actually relatively, you know, really poor, and that's something that I think Pankind is is doing. It's uh, doing a fantastic job in in uh, trying to fix that inequality. So thank you. Thank you, and thank you so much for your presentation tonight, Andrew. It was um, really informative and really interesting, and, and no problem about the time. I think everyone's really enjoyed it, so <laughs> thank you for that. And thank you, everybody else, for attending tonight. We really appreciate it, and um, we hope to see you at our next webinar. So thank you, everybody, and good night. Good night. Good night.